Welcome, welcome, welcome. That's Adam Gorney. I'm Mike Farrell. Uh, this is the Godfather and Gorney podcast, and we're going to start real quickly with recruiting. Kind of slow. There's been some decommitments, but not as many commitments. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Derek Davis choosing LSU. I mean, you're the Penn State guy. You're, you're from Pennsylvania. You know, you're not from Western PA, but you know Gateway High School. You know Terry Smith. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's the D-backs coach at Penn State. He was the head coach at Gateway. He's a legend there. This kid's from Gateway. He's supposed to choose between Penn State and Ohio State that he visits LSU, and all of a sudden he's headed out to LSU. Please explain to the Penn State fans what's happening. Yeah, I don't know if there's much of a good explanation here other than, you know, Penn State's 0-3, and the one that surprises me is Ohio State. I thought once he had visited Ohio State late that – was kind of leaning toward that way it seemed like a big 10 battle and then lsu kind of sneaks in and gets him a lot of times with commitments like that by signing day he might rethink things and could still end up in the big 10 but a huge pickup for lsu again it's obviously a school that develops defensive backs maybe better than anybody you know ohio, ohio state would definitely be in that discussion though um so i think this is a big time surprise that he goes to LSU because this felt like a, like a Penn State, Ohio State battle, Penn State trying to hang on the Terry Smith connections, obviously. But then that late visit to Ohio State seemed like it was going to be a factor, too. So I am definitely surprised by that one. Another late change is Rashawn Benny, uh, offensive tackle, defensive lineman, in-state kid choosing Michigan State over Michigan. This one sort of flipped over the last couple weeks. Um, again, do you think this is – poor play I mean is Michigan's one and two record it's not like Michigan State's lighting up the world so this was a bit of a surprise as well yeah I thought so too but you know you go back over the the lists of kids from in-state and Michigan State does a great job against Michigan against those kids you go down the list of guys um, I think we've done some stuff on that before that Michigan State really does a surprisingly good job and and now you know this isn't a Mark D'Antonio win this is a pure Mel Tucker win a really aggressive recruiter, um, you know, sort of changing up that offense a little bit as he gets going. It's not just going to be ground and pound like it was under D'Antonio. So, you know, for Rayshon Benny to, to fall in love with Mel Tucker and his staff this quickly when Jim Harbaugh is established and has had offensive linemen, and this is a good offensive lineman class for Michigan, that's worrisome. And I think that's a big time get for Michigan State there because I think Benny's pretty talented on both sides of the ball. Yeah, they also got Brandon Baldwin, who's a Juco kid, who's massive, six foot seven, three fifteen, a bit of a project, but that'll help along the offensive line as well. So good news for Michigan State. Obviously bad news for Penn State when it comes to in-state recruiting. That's another one lost. You could put on, you know, Marvin Harrison in there and Kyle McCord in there, Nolan Rucci in there. Um, you know, 2022 looks very good for Penn State. Uh, and Michigan, another in-state loss for them too. You know, even though it's to a team that's in state, you know, they're losing to Michigan State, but they're losing to LSU, they're losing to Alabama, they're losing to Notre Dame, they're losing a lot of guys. So these were two, I think, extremely important recruiting years in state for Penn State and Michigan, and, and they've fallen flat on their face there. So we'll see how that impacts them moving forward. Some 2022 stuff, you mentioned really Brown, the running back out of California. Um, you know, and, and JT Tuamalau. Did I get that right? Tuamalau. What I do is I try to say it as loud as possible so it doesn't sound wrong. And with some sort of weird accent that Tuimalau. I don't like. Yeah. Tu, 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 what, 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 how do you say it? Tuamalau. Tuamalau. All right. Um, I'm watching too much of uh, what's his face on uh, 90 Day Fiance. <laughs> Asuelu. Asuelu. Oh, Tuamalau. So, Tuamalau. Lots of what? Bama talk? Lots of Alabama talk. It feels like um, it feels like Ohio State still has the edge. But Alabama continues to recruit him very, very hard. They wouldn't waste their time if they didn't think they had a very good shot. And it seems like this is pulling toward more 50-50. And it's just going to be, I think, um, at some point he's going to have to get out and take some visits. 
He's got to have. He's going to have to see Ohio State. He's going to have to see Alabama. See what he feels is the better one. He's going to play his senior year, so this is not going to be a rush. I see your face there. It doesn't seem like you're believing this. Uh, yeah, no, he's going to have to take the visits on his own because there's going to be no visits. I mean, it's yeah, the 31st dead period, and Corona is raging in a third wave, and there's just no way. You know, the dead period is going to extend forever, and these 2021 20, kids will never have the opportunity to take an official visit. So he's going to have to get out there out on his own. I'm going to give you a dark horse here. I don't think it's 50-50 because I just am not going to count out Oregon. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't count out Oregon either. I mean, in terms of his leaders, I think it's Ohio State, Alabama equal right now. Oregon is definitely still going to be in there. Um, we've seen the guys that play that position at Oregon over the years, athletic, not incredibly overly physical guys, and they all succeed. So <laughs> DeForest Buckner and Eric Armstead and now Thibodeau, who wasn't really all that physical in high school, but just was a super athlete and now – will dominate there and, and he could be next in line. That's a huge selling point, but it's not like Ohio state and Alabama haven't had great defensive ends over the years too. So I think he's a kid that wants to probably play nationally. He and Foreman, I get the sense that they, they feel bigger than the PAC 12. They feel like they need to be on the national national level, national scale, all that kind of stuff, play for national championships at Oregon. That's a possibility, but it's an outside possibility um, at Ohio state and Alabama. It's, it's almost a definite. So I still feel both are going to leave. Malik Brown, why Alabama? I was I thought Oklahoma would be, you know, just kind of a fit for him the way they recruit California and the way their offense is structured. Yeah, so what I was told in the last couple of days is that Malik and the people around him, they always have people around him, uh, <laughs> feel that Alabama sort of is running a similar offense to Oklahoma. That, that they could get him the ball in a variety of ways and they're going to move it up and down the field and they feel he can kind of play that waddle role but also be a running back. He could do a little bit of both. He's, he's a little tiny guy, so he's not going to take the SEC pounding. But hiding behind that offensive line, maybe a la Barry Sanders, how he used to, how he used to do that and then sneak out. And with that speed and that shiftiness, I think, I think Alabama is the school. Don't forget, too, that he's close – with Najee Harris and Najee Harris is having tremendous success at Alabama, although a completely different player. I think he sees that success and I think he's drawn to it. I, I was told Oklahoma is kind of one of the teams slipping out of this. It's Alabama. He's interested in Oklahoma state. He's interested in LSU, maybe USC, but I would say Alabama now is the team on top. Yeah. Oklahoma state's interesting because they do obviously solid job with running backs and, and they're never mentioned with the Oklahoma's and Texas's of the world. So that's an interesting one. USC. I think we got to wait and see what happens with Helton. Um, the yeah. first game was not overly impressive, um, you know, but shortened season, I don't know, will they get rid of him? You know, can he run the table, all that stuff. So USC is kind of the wild card for all these guys, you know, with Corey Foreman, I know JT's not looking at him, but, uh, there were a few other guys that I was taught. Oh, the wide receiver class for 2022. I mean, there's a couple of tremendous California kids out there. And, you know, years ago, we would have locked them into USC. They're going to take their visits and then they're going to stick with USC. And now yeah. we just don't know. Yeah. T-Mac is a kid that's super interesting. He's, he was born in Hawaii and he still has kind of that personality. He's incredibly laid back. Like the most laid back person you could imagine. Imagine Tua, but like, on vacation you know he's like super laid back so you know Notre Dame is in there for him and they've always had that connection to Hawaiian kids and they've had success with them so I think Notre Dame is playing a factor but I would say USC and Notre Dame would be the only two schools that he's really looking at Oregon is also in there because he loved Marcus Mariota and and Oregon is going to recruit the hell out of everybody out here and then CJ Williams is like the opposite Super nice kid, but super intense. He reminds me of like a uh, little bit like Brew McCoy was. Um, jacked up, physical, constantly training, constantly wants to do everything. Was born in Tuscaloosa. So I think Alabama is going to play a factor there. I definitely think Ohio State is going to play a factor there. But he goes to modern day, and we all know that. that What, Mike? The modern day kids go right to USC. They do. Um, what happened to Sarah? Sarah has Malik Murphy. Right. He's obviously, in, but he's not locked in at USC. And they oh, haven't no, really not been, at all. 
They haven't been yeah, Sarah has, out lately. has uh, slid a little bit. As Bosco yeah. and Modern Day have risen, Sarah has slid. Yeah, because that was a USC feeder program for sure um, yeah. for a long time, and it, they just don't seem to be mentioned that much. So, no. all right, moving from recruiting, because there's, like I said, there's just not a lot going on. Um, you know, there are a few decommitments here and there. Uh, I think we'll see more, but you know, will we see what? those sting factors come out anytime? Do you think? I don't know. I don't know. Well, again, I told you the protocol, you didn't follow the protocol and now everything's screwed up and now I have to clean up your mess. It's not really screwed up. I mean, it's just, you know. trust me, if one thing is done differently, everything is screwed up. So I'll, I'll try to work on that for you. But um, yeah, the early signing period is, is a month away. Uh, yeah. There's been no indication whatsoever that they're going to change that. No indication that 85% of the kids won't sign, you know, I mean, it's still going to be the same as always. And, 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 you know, so the decommitment rash that we normally have, it's going to be more schools shedding players. We saw it with Arizona State a couple of weeks ago, and I think we're going to start seeing some schools shed players, um, especially since they really don't have an answer as to roster management from the NCAA as to how this is going to work with everybody getting an extra year. And you're essentially, you know, looking to have uh, 100 scholarship players when 85 is your limit. So, uh, it's going to be a bit of a mess there, but recruiting has been very slow because kids aren't taking visits. Kids can't go to games. I mean, they can on their own and they do sometimes, but um, you know, it's, it's been a little bit slow and it's always slow this time of year. So let's focus on what's not slow, which is the college football playoff talk. So I wrote this morning that it's over. Notre Dame beat Clemson and it's over. So here's my reasoning and you can shoot holes in it if you'd like. Alabama is Alabama. They're going to go undefeated. I have them defeating Florida in the SEC championship game, thus eliminating Florida. Okay. okay. Uh, Texas A&M, I have eliminated as well because they've already lost to Alabama. Now, they okay. could take two from the SEC, and we'll get to that in a second. I have Ohio State because the Big Ten is a joke. It's a nightmare, and uh, they're going to run the table. So there's two. Okay. I eliminated everybody from the Pac-12 simply because they're only playing seven games and in some cases six. Um, and, you know, I looked at the schedule of Oregon, which is the team that I would look to go undefeated. Uh, and it's horrible. There's nobody good on it. Um, they may end up playing an average USC team, you know, for the Pac-12 title, but I don't think that's going to get them over the hump. Big 12, you're done. Uh, one loss, Oklahoma State. Even if they ran the table, does not hold the clout that a one-loss Texas or Oklahoma would. And Clemson, back to Clemson, Notre Dame. So Notre Dame wins without, you know, Clemson doesn't have Trevor Lawrence. So let's say Notre Dame wins again. All right. This is the crazy part of my, my uh, logic. Notre Dame wins again, undefeated in the playoff, no brainer. Two loss Clemson team with Trevor Lawrence versus a two loss Florida team with losses to A&M, and Alabama versus a two loss A&M team with losses to Florida or somebody else. Um, I think they take Clemson and, and if Clemson wins the rematch, then you've got a one loss Notre Dame, a one loss Clemson, and you got both of those teams can make a case for the playoff and they're both in. That's my thinking. I think a two loss Clemson really does get the benefit of the doubt here, especially with how wacky the world has been in college football this year. Go ahead. Okay, so here are some of your faults. All right. One, Clemson didn't lose because they didn't have Trevor Lawrence. DJ threw for over 400 yards and set records and looked awesome. Yeah, but I'm talking about the like, the, the 10,000 foot view is Clemson lost and they were shorthanded on defense and they didn't have their superstar quarterback. So, okay, yep, but I get your point. So, I get that. Okay, so let's say for, for your first problem is Notre Dame could beat them again. So then Clemson is absolutely out. No chance in hell that they get in. The problem is, is if Alabama blows out Florida mm -hmm. and Texas A&M continues to beat people like they beat South Carolina into submission, 48-3 or whatever the score was, Texas A&M's only loss is to Alabama. And the two, maybe the two best teams in the whole SEC 
are SEC West teams and they can't play in the SEC championship together. So I think they definitely don't take a two loss Clemson team. They would take a one loss A&M team that did not play for their conference championship, just like they did Ohio state a few years ago, yeah, well. or they take a, or they take a two loss Oklahoma team. No. Let's not count out Oklahoma. No, they are crap Oklahoma, losses. Their losses Oklahoma stink. is not out of this. They, their losses stink. Wouldn't matter. They lost early. Doesn't matter. They're lot, they have two losses that stink. Ohio State won the national championship, I believe, the year they had one stinky loss, which was Virginia Tech early, right? You can't have two, you know, baby diaper stink bomb losses like they had and recover. And you're not going to take two teams from the same division in college football two sec west teams going to the playoff it's ridiculous because you already had your playoff what i don't think it's all that ridiculous because texas a&m would be the team if alabama blows out florida which i don't think is going to happen but if it does texas a&m is the team that also beat the team that was in the sec championship and they only have one loss yeah, but that one loss is by 20-plus points to Alabama, so why even include them in the playoff? We already know this. We've seen this. Well, then why would you, why would you include Clemson that lost twice to Notre Dame and they have would Trevor be in the Lawrence. playoff as well? They have Trevor Lawrence, who's like the most you know, famous college football player in the country, and they've been in the national title um, game numerous times. They've been in the playoff numerous times. The Blue Bloods get the love. As Here's the other issue, Mike. What? Here's the other issue. If uh, USC goes undefeated and wins the Pac-12, they are not going to say no to the Southern California media market. They're just not going to. Yeah, they are. The no, Pac-12 they're not. doesn't get in when they play 12 games. Well, because they lose four of them. USC, no. Nobody wants to see USC in the playoff. They just don't. <laughs> media market I, or not, you know, it's just – so my problem is, is this. You mentioned Ohio State, but they're a blue blood, right? So they're going to get the benefit of the doubt. Ohio State's in. No, Ohio State's in. When, they, when they went over Penn State. Yes. When they, when they shouldn't have, right? Penn State should have gone. Ohio yes, State absolutely. Penn State should have gone. Urban Meyer, right? Blue right. blood. Who was the quarterback at the time? Uh, Braxton Miller. Big name, right? Penn State. Eh. One of yeah. the most historical programs in all yeah, of college football. absolutely. But, you know, they don't have Urban Meyer. They don't have no. 15 first-round picks. So they got the benefit of the doubt there. Yes. So Clemson versus a one-loss Texas A&M team, to me, Clemson's going to get the benefit of the doubt. It's just – first of all, I don't I – As one they, loss or two losses? Well, I'm predicting they win, and it's one and one. Okay. Okay. So, so that's why – yes, I think Clemson goes, no doubt. That's why I think it's done. So does Notre Dame. Notre Dame goes, yes, I think Notre Dame goes no matter what now. So that's my prediction. But on the worst case scenario for the ACC is that Notre Dame wins both times. I still think Clemson has a chance to be picked. Because I think never, never in a million time years. time this Notre Dame-Clemson showdown rolls around, we could be talking about the number two and three team in the country. A battle of two, three. No. And take them both. You do not take a two-loss team that, that lost to the same team twice in your own conference. No way. Well, it's 2020, bro. Texas A&M would have a shot. Pac-12 undefeated team would have a shot. They shouldn't. And I still believe a two-loss Oklahoma would have a shot. No. 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 Do I have to, do I have to pull up those Oklahoma losses to remind you? Kansas State, Iowa State. And how bad is Kansas State now? Well, they had Skylar Thompson at the time, and Oklahoma was up big in that game and then let Kansas State back in it with a freshman quarterback. But now that freshman quarterback growed up. Growed. He growed up. What, so what happens if Oklahoma growed. blows Oklahoma State out here, in two weeks? Oklahoma State's stellar uh, resume includes wins over Most, M-O-S-T, right? That's most. (laughs) I say most because it's Missouri State. So it's – all right, most is better. Uh, They they have a win over Texas, who stinks, you know, very average. Uh, A win over TCU, Texas Tech, and Kansas. Woo, slow down. 
Yeah, but now they're going to have to beat Oklahoma State, which for some reason has completely lost the, the ability and function to play offense, which is so <laughs> strange. And then West Virginia and Baylor, too. Blech. West Virginia is pretty good. Baylor's yeah, they, there. They don't, they don't have the games left, I think, to get back in this with two losses and two losses to Kansas State and Iowa State. It's just not good. So, uh, And, again, going back to the, uh, the, the, the Pac-12, I mean, you got to be kidding me with this. I know. I know. But what, what are your other options? I, I think Texas is taking, if taking Clemson the loses again, they're out. If the best option would be Texas A&M. If Clemson wins again, they're both in and your scenario plays out. Yeah. And that's what I think is going to happen. But I, I even think that with the two losses, uh, they're – and again, listen, you could shoot holes in it. You haven't shot holes in it yet as far as who Clemson's beaten which is nobody. Let, let's also remember Clemson almost lost to Boston College at home two weeks ago. Correct. And, and I'm looking for Clemson's schedule because they're off this week. And let's also stop thinking that you have to win a conference championship to be one of the four best teams in college football. I think that's the dumbest idea that has been propagated against us. Texas A&M is in the best division or generally usually the best division when LSU doesn't have Bo Pelini as defensive coordinator and Auburn doesn't have Chad Morris as offensive coordinator. I mean, come on. I mean, one loss in the SEC West doesn't get you in, but Clemson is going to get in with one loss against Notre Dame. Give me a break. Yeah, I hear you. And, and, and this is Clemson's victories. Wake Forest, Citadel, UVA, Miami, Georgia Tech, Syracuse, BC. We're assuming Florida State. We're assuming Pitt. We're assuming Virginia Tech. That's and they pretty- squashed Miami. And I, and I still think Clemson is great with a full team. But but that's pretty awful. That's, a, yeah. that's Those are awful wins. But, you know, my point is there's nobody really putting themselves in position had Florida beaten Texas A&M, then we would easily be talking about Florida and Alabama being in the playoff, but they didn't. Texas A&M doesn't really play. I don't know. I mean, they beat in Florida. That's a great win. But who else have they beaten? South Carolina. Oh, yeah, they're good. Speaking Arkansas of what, by two touchdowns. Will Muschamp is on the hot seat, as we know today. But they've beaten Vanderbilt, Mississippi State, Arkansas, and South Carolina, other than Florida. So, And they've got Tennessee, Ole Miss, LSU, and Auburn left on their schedule. So it's weird. You know, this is the year they should have expanded to eight. Okay, let me ask you this, Mike. Mm-hmm. Who, who's more deserving? Cincinnati, Cincinnati's pretty deserving, I think. Yeah, but we can't even include them. BYU, they look pretty good. Although you called them a fraud. I did. I, they're not. I was wrong. BYU was pretty good, though. Yeah. BYU was good. No, I called them a fraud. They were wrong. I thought Boise was going to uh, kick their butts, and they destroyed them. BYU is good, but they don't play anybody either. I'm not even including them. I'm just refusing to include Cincinnati. I'm refusing to include BYU because I want you to beat real teams. That's it. You know. Well, give them an opportunity to, to prove it. I mean, Cincinnati's wins are over APSU, whatever that is. Austin P, I think. <laughs> Army, USF, SMU, Memphis, and Houston with a vicious schedule left of East Carolina, UCF, Temple, and Tulsa. So they're going to beat Houston, who's a decent team, Memphis, which is a decent team, SMU, which is a good team, and UCF, which is a good team. Nah. BYU is the team that deserves to go. You watch that team play, they might have one of the top three or four quarterbacks in college football, one of the best offensive lines in college football, and a nasty defense. They are good. And their wins are over Navy, Troy, Louisiana Tech, UTSA, Houston, Texas State, Western Kentucky, and Boise State. Wow. Went went up to the blue turf and blew them out, even though they were on their third string quarterback at the time. I'm just saying, it's just like, don't give me those teams. Give me what power. What would be the five. line in a BYU Notre Dame matchup? What would you What would you give BYU? Six, maybe. Yeah, I think it would be close because I still don't believe Notre Dame can put up points. I mean, they did against Clemson. The double overtime obviously helps with the over. 
And let's also forget that Clemson blew that game out. That game was 33, 26 with a minute and a half left or something. And Notre Dame went right down the field. That was embarrassing. Well, Dabo blew it too. And they, they have a lot of losses on defense right now. They're playing a lot of young guys, but excuses don't mean anything. I don't care about excuses. I don't care about, you know, Florida's excuse that, that, you know, fans at, at college station were coughing on their kids or whatever. Right. I don't care about Texas A&M's excuse about losing Alabama. I don't care about any of your excuses whatsoever. Just win and you're in. But right now there's three uh, teams that look elite. Any chance Notre Dame blows this and loses to somebody? I mean, they're not undefeatable. Who do they have left? Let me pull this up for you. Pull it up. I think we also have to address Georgia, Mike. I pulled them up under independence because I'm just – I can't get used to this. So they're in the ACC, Corny. Did you know that? Yes. They've got left at Boston College, which is a rivalry game for BC, and not an easy out. No. They could lose that game. Yeah. Djokovic playing against his old team. And Halfley is a great coach. At North Carolina with a tremendous offense. That That is a dangerous game. Yeah. Syracuse and Wake, which are two wins. No, no, no. <laughs> so they could trip and fall. Here. They could. Then what happens, really Mike? have the ugliest playoff field in the history of college football playoff if, you know, Notre Dame trips and then beats Clemson a second time and then you got a two-loss Notre Dame team you're considering and – No, they'd you know, be out. Uh, yeah. But then who are you going to put in? Like – BYU. No, see, that's why I'm saying it's going to be a horrible, horrible field. Because BYU is just, you know, that's an, that's an independent program playing a bunch of crap. So then you got, what are you going to have? BYU, Cincinnati, Ohio State, and Alabama in the playoff? Ooh, might as well have two buys, you know? <laughs> I mean, you might as well. This is why this is the year that they should have gone eight. And and the Pac-12 I'm eliminating because, and I had a big argument with Rick Neuheisel on Full Ride today about this, which was fun because I love arguing. And he's a big Pac-12 homer, as we know. And, and I got a text from a certain Pac-12 coach who was very upset with what I wrote this morning, that the Pac-12 doesn't deserve to be in there. All right? MC? I, I'm reserving my Thanksgiving turkey. And they just kicked off playing football. Yeah. So forget it. Now here's Oregon's schedule. Ready? Murderer's Row. Stanford, Washington State, UCLA, Oregon State, Cal, and Washington. Are you telling me that that team right there deserves to be in the playoff? And then they'd have to beat USC, uh, uh, you would guess, in the Pac-12 champion. Yeah, let's look at USC's schedule, shall we? Which it might be worse, actually. Uh, It's not pretty. (laughs) You got Arizona State. Arizona, Utah, Colorado, Washington State, and UCLA. I mean, these are all, you know, sisters of the poor, horrible, awful programs. Utah is not horrible, but the rest stink. So then you've got an undefeated USC team who's beaten nobody against an undefeated Oregon team who's beaten nobody, and the winner goes 8-0 and gets in the playoff? Come on. It's crap. Had they played at the beginning of the season, I would have agreed. My biggest question is, you reserve your turkey? I just made that up kind of like it made the story sound better. Oh, okay. I, I thought you went to like Honey Baked Ham or something. No, we're not getting a turkey this year. Why? Uh, it's a whole thing. We're getting Chateaubriand. I'm not lying. <laughs> this ain't me. Listen, I would eat Italian ices and pudding. Right? What are you holding? These are my USFL magnets. I love them. I love the USFL. <laughs> We're going down the drain here. Birmingham Stallions. I, uh, I, I always hold these. These are my like nervy thing. But I, 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 do, have to say, I do have to say, um, turkey is overrated. Turkey is not good. No. Turkey's I'm a ham good. guy. Ham and then prime rib for Christmas. Ham's good, but ham's a Christmas thing. No. Ham is turkey's an Easter thing, really. Turkey's good, man. It dark meat. Dark though. meat. Dark. I'm a white meat person, and I really love a lot of gravy, and I love leftovers. But yes. this year, did you say shock? <laughs> On the gravy part. <laughs> so I, I got a funny story for you. Ready? <laughs> I 
you want to talk about a kick in the cojones, right? I, I got jury duty Monday, right? Yeah. I pushed it off from earlier, you know, because it came in April. And I'm yeah. like, I'm not going on jury duty. So they give you the option to push it off once. So yeah. here it is, November. And I'm like, oh, I pushed it off. I said, there's got to be a way to get out of this with COVID. I am highly susceptible to everything. I mean, look right. at me. I'm a medical mer marvel that I'm alive, right? Yes. So I contact my doctor and I say, hey, is there, there, is there a waiver form or something? So she sends me the waiver form. And then she sends me a note through my chart, which is awesome. And she says, you qualify as a, co as a COVID uh, high risk candidate um, for serious illness. And I can definitely write you a letter for jury duty if you need to, or you could be a remote juror, which I'm not gonna do. A remote juror. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so could you move the camera closer to the criminal's face, please? Yeah, right. I can't see <laughs> the deviousness in his eyes. So, Sir, please get off your phone while listening to the abused. So I've had, I've had asthma since I was born, right? So I'm like, okay, asthma it is, you know? She gives me three reasons as to why I'm high risk for COVID death. The first two, can you guess them? <clears throat> okay, asthma. Nope. That was third. Oh, that's third. Okay. Obesity. Yep. And um, hmm. Obesity twice. <laughs> <laughs> She sends this message. She goes, under under section one, you qualify because of your obesity. And I'm like, yeah. Oh. And then, and under section two, you qualify because of your excessive weight, which is another word for obesity. <laughs> for obesity. <laughs> and maybe your asthma. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> this is the woman I let fondle me once a year and keep me healthy. And that was a kick hard kick like a like a like a roundhouse chop right new on line one she just writes O, and then on line two she writes beast <laughs> <laughs> so of course i took it and i checked what she told me and i asked her for a letter explaining how fat i am yeah you can't risk going to jury duty mike That's... no i i it's too important to this company first of all i mean without me what are you guys gonna do you've been to jury duty before as have i everyone there is young fit and, and really with it, I'm telling you, if, if I ever have to get brought before a jury, I want a judge to make the decision because there's, there's no way that those people are my peers. Well, yeah, they're not, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's almost like going to the DMV. It's like how mm -hmm. old human beings. Yes. You know, and the, the other thing is I find people guilty or innocent within the first two seconds of looking at them. Right, yes. You know, and I would have to go all the way to the courthouse and explain that. Do you have any, uh, you know, bias towards guilt or innocence? And uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, I do. I think Everyone everybody does. Everybody who's in court is guilty, period. <clears throat> well. So, eliminate me from jury duty now. But the, the fat thing hit me twice and that was awful. I mean, that was really mean. So I, I was all depressed last night, but I filled out my little form this morning and I did ask her for a letter explaining how fat I am. And yeah. uh, I'm waiting on that letter. So because we have rankings meetings next week and I can't be at jury duty for either for that, but I'm high risk. High risk. You got to stay in the house, hide and, and never go outside. Which makes me eat more and makes me fatter, which makes right. me more high risk. So it's like a vicious cycle. So like leaving the house is not good for me at all, but yet staying in the house, I'll be on 600 pound life soon. And you know, it's just bad either way. So you're not, you're not that big. I'm not. You're like, really not. Well, here's the thing. The BMI was created in 1918, right? Or whatever. Right. Yeah. It's 2020. Yes. You know, the life expectancy back then was like 40 years. Right. Yes. Cavemen years, you know? Yes. Now it's 80. And yes. it's almost like, have you ever gone to Fenway Park? Never been there. Okay. If you go to Fenway Park and you sit in the right field bleachers, Fenway loves tradition. Yeah, they so they haven't changed the, their seats in 100 the years. The seats are the same size as they were in the early 1900s. Yeah. So a guy like me gets there and one hip gets in and the other one doesn't. So I got complete half an ass cheek on the rail and I'm like this, enjoying the game. And I'm like, you guys could modernize the seats. People are bigger than they used to be. Like yeah. we discovered fast food and stuff. So 
No, I, I, but again, the fact that she didn't just, she could have said asthma and left yeah, me alone. Yeah, just say asthma. We get it. You're obese too. That was mean. That was a rough I, one. That was tough. Yeah. I don't know how we got on that, but that hurt me deeply. So college football playoffs done, as I mentioned. Gorney makes some good points. Um, and, and we'll see how it shakes out. You know, next week, Notre Dame could lose and everything yeah. could be changed. Uh, um, well, this weekend. Uh, what was the other thing? Oh, overreactions. I wanted to talk about overreactions. So you're on Twitter a lot. I'm on Twitter a lot. College football overreactions. I'll start with the first one I saw. James Franklin should be fired immediately. Let's buy him. And we just gave him a new contract. Yeah, completely stupid. I mean, obviously the 0-3 start is abysmal. The performance against Maryland was embarrassing. Um, they looked they look terrible. The, the final score wasn't even indicative. I think they were down 35-7 to a Maryland team that's not very good. Um, at home. Maryland account trolling Penn State? Yeah, let's not get too crazy. I mean, Penn State has completely dominated that series in an embarrassing fashion. Thought it was funny. But uh, how about Talia looking pretty decent at quarterback? Rakeem yep. Jarrett had a, had a big game. Penn State's weird, though. I mean, I don't know. I'll tell you this. I watch Penn State every week. I have for 30-something years. I don't – Kirk Shiraka does not seem to understand what's going on or with that offense, or he's changing it in a way. James Franklin against Ohio State didn't even have his headset up, uh, down, over his mouth when the offense was on the field. It almost like he was letting Kirk Shiraka dig his own grave a little bit there. And then against Maryland, they looked awful on offense. Sean Clifford was overthrowing. They weren't throwing a Friar Muth enough. I don't know. I, of course I wouldn't fire him. I think Penn State and LSU almost have the same exact record over the last four years. But, of course, he's not going to get fired. But uh, it, they just don't look very good. And they're only three-point favorites at Nebraska this weekend. And you're talking about a team that looks, oh, my God, just terrible, just clueless. Well, um, Nebraska looks one. bad overreaction Wednesday Scott Frost needs to be gone he's not a fit it's not working see the weird thing is I think he's a fit but it's just not working first of all they're not getting great players um, okay Indiana doesn't get great players either yeah neither does Northwestern really <laughs> and, they're, and they're winning games um, but it seems like he is a fit there but he's just not doing very well if his name wasn't Scott Frost he'd already be gone um, you know, they have problems at quarterback now. They have Luke McCaffrey in there who does not seem to know what's going on. They really can't do anything on either side of the ball that impresses you. And then they lose to Northwestern. It's just not working. Um, I don't think it's an overreaction to say maybe we should move on and try someone else. If, if, even if the coach after the game tells the alumni to go F themselves and and is really mean like Bo Pelini and a terrible uh, person uh, when he was at Lincoln. And that's why he, that's why he was gone. Uh, right. He was just not, you know, conducive to what people expect in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, you know, Scott Frost, uh, do you ever see a situation where Scott Frost has that team at 10 and two or 11 and one? I don't know. No, I don't either. When he was coming off the UCF undefeated season, going back to his, his, you know, school and uh, there was so much excitement about it. I thought they would get uh, a nice wave of recruiting bump, you know, and, and they did get, uh, you know, Martinez from Tennessee, but he hasn't panned out. I thought they'd recruit the Southeast a lot better. I thought they'd um, be more of a factor in the Midwest when it comes to recruiting. And, and I thought he was a good enough coach to take, you know, three stars and a few four stars and, and coach them up, but he's not. Um, so, Mike, Scott Frost, as a coach, has had four full seasons. He has three losing seasons. Mm -hmm. If you take 13-0 and out of there, which is, of course, unfair, but if you take that out, he's 15-24 and as a head coach. Yeah, that looks like a Willie Taggart resume to me. Yeah, and I was very critical of Willie Taggart, and it didn't work out, and, you know, I mean – where is Nebraska getting better? You know, like where? No, it's not happening. Um, next overreaction, Harbaugh's got to go. This is this has run its course. 
Yeah, uh, another one. Uh, they looked awful against Indiana. Awful. He looked awful. Don Brown looked awful. Josh Gaddis looked awful. Everybody looked awful. Another very difficult situation. I guess there is maybe some tension between him and the university president. Um, you know, saying Vincent Gray is your best cornerback and then he goes and gets blown out and burned again over and over again. I mean, that's, you just look, you just look like, you know, you don't know what you're talking about with your own team. Again, cut ties, let him go somewhere else. It's just not working out. And, and this is year, I believe, five. Oh. Gotta Six? be like no, it's. I mean, if if it's your, it's it's if Frost has been at Nebraska for three years, Harbaugh has to be there for six, right? Yeah, I think this is six. Hold on, I'm looking. I mean, it's been forever. Um, and, and 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 again, and this is another question. One, two, three, four. Yeah, this is six. Year six. You know, and he has a decent record there. He has three ten win seasons, but if the expectation is have a nice season, have a winning year, go to a nice bowl game, enjoy a week in Orlando, then fine. Then this is the team. But the expectation for at Michigan, probably unfairly, is to win national titles or at least be in the playoff. Even though they haven't really shown the ability to do that in decades. Um, you Where know? is that not the expectation, though? Like, let's say Washington state suddenly became a consistent nine or 10 win team for three or four years and they couldn't get over the hump. Yeah. The expectation would be that the next step, you know, again, I, I lived up in the Northeast, Tom O'Brien won nine or 10 games every year for a decade. And, and the BC fans got tired of him, and, and GD, Gene DiFilippo got rid of him, you know, sort of pushed them out to NC state because they couldn't take the next step. You know, there is no next step for Boston College. They're not. No, going I know, I, and that's that's sort of what I've been saying about teams like Michigan well, and, they and need Nebraska. To be put in that Maryland. category now, Michigan needs to be put in that category. I know they got great legends. I know there's Desmond Howard in the post and Charles Woodson and all that stuff, but Michigan needs to be put in that category. Tennessee, more so than anybody, this Tennessee is an actual reaction. Man. Jeremy Pruitt needs to be fired. Um, that that's I've seen that everywhere. Uh, Tennessee needs to be put in that category. Uh, Miami needs to be put in that category. I just don't know when it's going to be. How far removed do you get from your last national championship before you realize we're never going to do that again? Well, that's the thing too, Mike. You, you mentioned Desmond Howard and Charles Woodson. Those guys are now so old that they're out of the NFL and doing Fox pregame for college. I mean, that was 25 years ago. That wasn't uh, five years ago and they've kind of hit the skids a little bit. Um, they're paying Jim Harbaugh $8 million. They are not paying him $8 million to, you know, get blown out by Ohio state. And that's another thing. And that's why everybody's like, this is the greatest college football rivalry. A rivalry is only good if it goes both ways. And Ohio state, I think has won 16 of the last 20. I mean, it's not exactly like, like they hate each other and the, whatever they want to say, but Ohio state goes on the field and blows them out and, and, and wins those games easily a lot a lot. And so Michigan, I think is one of those teams that feels like they should be on the cusp of being a national contender and being in the playoff. And I think that they recruit that way that we can get back to being a national player. Um, but it's just not there. I mean, Giles Jackson and, and Roman Wilson are nice players, but they're not elite wide receivers that are going to take you to the national championship. Ronnie Bell, Joe Milton, um, well, what about the expectations at Penn State? When's the last time they won a national championship? Well, they should have won one in 94, but they got robbed. 94 was a billion years ago. Well, absolutely. I, and, I, and I think that that's a similar situation, but Penn State's at least played Ohio State tougher over the last few years. True, but again, you haven't won in 100 years. So, you know, the, the expectations should be higher at, at, at Auburn, at Florida State. Um, yes. Even getting to a national title game, you know, at, at Oregon, even getting there, Notre Dame, you know, that's better than, than some of these programs that are wanting their coaches fired and just, you know, it's just not working. And, and listen, I agree. The Harbaugh thing is not working based on the expectations and it's time for that to change. Franklin is not going to be touched and he shouldn't be. It's stupid. Um, Frost, I don't think he should be 
fired or anything like that. I think you've got to give that guy a chance because, you know, who else are you going to get that, that is going to turn that thing around? And, and Tennessee, you know, Pruitt, you know, he, he was coming off, what, eight straight wins, and now they're in the dumper and they're going to finish, you know, four and six or three and seven this season. And, and now people want him gone too. And he was the greatest coach at Tennessee in the history of the world since Philip Fulmer just six weeks ago. Yeah, no, I think I think firing Jeremy Pruitt or even thinking that he's on the hot seat is dumb. Uh, he's recruiting really, really well. Butch Jones recruited really, really well too, though. But he had a, he's gotten a lot of playmakers in that 2020 class. He had Harrison Bailey in that class. I really do, and this is kind of you know he obviously didn't play well against Arkansas, but they just need to get over this Guarantano hump and start moving forward with a different offense. You say <laughs> it's so funny because. You- People talk about Guarantano as if it's a an infectious disease. Right. Like you just have to get over this Guarantano. You know, <laughs> he's got a case of the Guarantano. Guarantano nineteen. Yeah, and it's it's you know it's a five year seems to be four year five year thing that you just got to get over. But once you're symptom free of Guarantano, everything's going to be better. You know, they can't develop, you know, they can't develop quarterbacks consistently. They haven't. And, you know, recruiting's good. Average star rating, 3.48 in this class. They're going to slide outside the top 10. Yeah. It's solid. It's nothing that's going to change everything. But I will say this. Last year, I said Manny Diaz should be canned because this is clearly not going to work out. Right. And he's had a good year this year. And yeah. So, I mean, they had some embarrassing losses last year. But there are coaches you can see that are currently in their, in their position that aren't going to take – teams where they want to be Harbaugh is never going to win the big 10 he's never going to make the playoff and and honestly this is so funny because this is two weeks removed or three weeks removed for me thinking that this is could be the year if they win out and lose to Ohio State in a close game we could have two from the big 10 and, and Michigan could be the second one and now they're just so embarrassingly awful I was so wrong you know that's just not going to work Frost is not going to lead them to, you know, the promised land and, and national championships. But I think he's a good coach and I think he's a good fit for them. So they should keep him. Um, Pruitt, I'm, I'm on the fence about it. I don't know. I like, I, I mean, I think Pruitt is fine. I, what do you do with Frost? I guess you keep him. But Harbaugh, look at that team that took the field against Minnesota. And we know Minnesota's a fraud now. But that defense was flying around. They scored a defensive touchdown. They had a special teams play that set up another score. They looked good. They're flying around, making plays. Milton was playing good. And two weeks later, they take the field against Indiana and get blown out, you know? And yeah. Is, that, is that people not listening? Is that coaches over coaching or under coaching or not paying attention? And, they lost to Michigan State, and Michigan State lost to Rutgers. I mean, and, and they, then got blown out by Iowa. I mean, 49-7 blown out. Yeah. I, it's, it's hard to figure some of these losses this year, and, and to put the chain together this year would be fun because you could, you could put the chain together and somehow, by the end of the season, I think go from a team like Rutgers to Alabama somehow. I mean, yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Kind of how it works, you know. I mean, Texas A&M, Florida, Florida, whatever. Yeah, we know Florida is a better team than Texas A&M, but Texas A&M beat them up close, so you can't, you know, you can't put A&M ahead of them. And it's just, <clears throat> I mean, you can't put Florida ahead of A&M. So it's just one of those things. So, yeah, we've got a lot of coaching situations. We got Pac-12 football. I don't think anybody cares. I couldn't think of a more boring start to Pac-12 football, and and that's a shame. You know, because people have gotten used to not having that night game, and now they're starting at, what, 9 a.m.? Nine. Yeah, there was a 9 a.m. kick. USC, Arizona State was a 9 a.m. kick. People want to see USC, Arizona State, or they want to see Oregon and Stanford. They want to see them at 1030 at night. You're coming off a day where you started watching game day at 10, and you've watched three football games, and now you, you know, nightcap it with a Pac-12 game. And usually yeah. some crazy things happen. But a 9 a.m. kick is a stupid idea. It takes away from the Pac-12 even as much as playing a limited schedule does. 
nobody really cares. And, and, you know, it's a shame because I think had there not been a pandemic, I think Oregon would be a team that would make the playoff. I think if, if Tyler show, you know, plays any way, what, like we think he can, the weapons they have on offense and that defense, um, you know, as well as the offensive line could carry them to the playoff. So I don't know. Noah Sewell looked pretty good, huh? <laughs> what a beast. A beast. Freaking beast. He is. There's certain guys that grow on you. You know, yeah. takes a long time. And then there's then there's guys that grow on you and suck. And it, through the recruiting process and all the rankings I've done over the years, I, I think of the guys that grow on you and grow on you and grow on you. And it, they, well, I, I shouldn't say suck. That's kind of mean. But they don't pan out, you know, like a like a Derek Green, you know. Yeah. Um, and then there's a Sewell who, where you got to see him 16 times, Noah, and and realize that this is a freak athlete and believe it because he doesn't play good competition. And he's 260 pounds and he's playing linebacker and all this stuff. It's just the the evaluation to me, the whole thing is is fascinating. Um, this year, we're not going to have all-star games. So we're going to have our rankings meetings next week for 21 and 22. And then in January, we're going we're gonna to go deep and finish off the 2021 class. Um, you know, obviously, there'll still be some straggling senior film. There'll be some very, very limited all-star activity. Um, but it, this is going to be a class unlike any other. So I, I look forward to in a few years looking back at this and seeing what we got right or wrong. And um, 2022, I love that class. I think that class is loaded. So you know, we'll see about that. So, was there any other college football topics you wanted to discuss, Mr. Gorney? Do you have uh, Mac Jones as number one on your Heisman list? Mac Jones? What about my boy Kyle Trask? Uh, so, you have, you have Trask first? Defense. You have Trask first? No, I... Uh, hmm. No, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it would be Mac Jones, but Trask? Torched. Jordan. He's not even second. Who is? Fields. Oh, yeah, Fields. And he's not even third. But, but my boy DJ, is he going to make a run? No, because Trevor is third. I know Trevor looked like he had no energy on it. Shocking that the, the COVID-19 is very dangerous for a guy like Trevor Lawrence. Well, here are the dumbest optics on earth. Trevor Lawrence <laughs> can travel to South Bend, Indiana. Yeah, stood on the sidelines. Stood on the sidelines, you know, pull his mask down to talk to people. Yes. Um, but hasn't cleared the cardiac test. And then can be swarmed by 10,000 rabid, heavy breathing Notre Dame fans who are super excited about the victory over Clemson. Uh, let's leave him home, you know? And I know he's there. He wants to be there. He's a team guy. I get that. It's nothing on Trevor. Trevor didn't do any of this. It's the COVID protocol that is so stupid that you can see there's Trevor Lawrence. He's on COVID protocol and he's on the sidelines and he can't play. He could be on the sidelines. He could play, put a helmet on, let him play. He's going to breathe on as many people. And I know it's the cardiac thing. He could, you know, fall to death from a cardiac problem. That hasn't happened yet. Um, it's just so stupid. Don't get me started. We got, we got wave three starting here in Connecticut. We're down to 50% capacity in restaurants. We're heading in the wrong direction. It's almost sure. as if the strategy that we've been using for nine months has not worked. And we should maybe think of another strategy. I, it hasn't worked for anybody though. China, it worked for. Singapore has no cases. Australia, no cases, never wore masks. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm a herd immunity guy for sure, except for my obesity. Yeah. Uh, you know, because I am a risk. I don't want to hear anything about China. Okay. China. Yeah, China fixed it. No. What about the letter from Notre Dame's uh, yeah. president? Don't get your panties in a wad. They're wadded. Yeah, well, who cares? You know what? The, the kids ran on the field. whoop de do. You know, the yeah, end of the world is end of the world all right we're not going to talk politics but i know you were following the election quite closely very closely yeah so you and i are both going to lose a ton of money you especially yeah being a one percenter 
is not good these days. Mike, all I know is one thing. You don't pay your fair share. <laughs> you should see. You should see every year what I get back, man. I have an accountant do my taxes because I have other interests and such. And I see the amount in, that comes out in taxes. And I'm just, every year, I'm just, I'm just floored. I'm like, I can't believe I just handed that amount of money over that I worked for, but it's all going to come back to me in social security unless I get rid of that because yeah, once I'm 62, stand back. And once I'm 67, as everybody else, what? You'll still get the same amount as everybody else in social security, right? No, that's not how it works. No. You, you got to look into it. You have no retirement plan, do you? Yes, I do. What is it? I have my 401k. That's it? My, my, and my wife has Calsters. You don't have any other savings? No, no savings. I have no savings. Yes, of course I do. By but the I, time you're X age, you should own your house. You should have, you know, X amount in your 401k and also in your retirement savings, your individual retirement savings. And they say you need a million dollars to retire. So what's going to happen to me is I'm going to reach that million dollar mark probably the day before I keel over and die from obesity. Obesity and asthma. <laughs> <laughs> and that million dollars is going to go to my wife and she's going to have the biggest party you could ever imagine. Uh, and it's not going to be a remembering Mike party. It's going not to be- a celebration of life. No, no celebration of life. It's going to be like that. He's gone. <laughs> <laughs> He's not in the house anymore. Um, all right, let me, let me grab a helmet. Hold on. All right. Hold on. Well, I'm telling you, I'm leaving California for greener pastures soon. Mike. You're not. You're staying right there. And it's because I get a 13% inc pay increase because I don't have to pay as much in taxes. Oregon, very solid. Huh? Very huh? solid. I was crapping on the Pac-12, their limited schedule and Oregon schedule, but yet... I give them love. They have by far, and I, I voted for Michigan when we did the whole uniform thing. Michigan has a very tremendous traditional helmet that I love, but yes. by far not even close. Oregon has the best array of helmets. This is one of six Oregon helmets I have. Gorgeous, right? If anyone else has a cool a group of helmets that doesn't get enough respect is Oklahoma State. Oh, yeah, with, with uh, Pistol Pete? Yeah, Pistol Pete. And then this past weekend, they had Cowboys written on it. Yeah. And then they have a shiny one with, like, yep. looks like a sheriff's badge. Even their traditional OSU one with the white and the orange yeah. is cool. They're cool. Barry Sanders one is cool. Yeah, they're cool. Very cool. So what's funny about this helmet here is I got this. Thank you very much. You know who you are. I love you. And I took a picture of it to send to my buddy, right? Because, you know, he loves helmets too. But with a chrome, you got to make sure you're wearing pants. Yeah, pants are important. Yeah, I didn't know that. So I took a picture and I was in my underpants. And Why? all you see is this guy squatting in boxers, Batman boxers, taking a picture of the, of the helmet. And he's like, don't ever do that again. Like, you know, send me the helmet, but take a picture of the side with the, don't take a picture of the shiny side. And I don't want to see your boxers and all that stuff. So I've learned a valuable lesson about helmet picture taking. See, Freud would say you wanted him to see you in your boxers. And I, I think that's true. Wouldn't Freud say that I wanted my mom to see me? Also that, maybe. It's so pretty. Is that a helmet that has a Rose Bowl sticker on it? That's pretty nice. Oh, yeah. Listen, I don't mess around. Mike, I see you've done your hair this morning. I never do. I put a hat on all the time. That's a face that strikes fear. I could tackle, right? All right, TV time. Let's finish it up. Okay, hurry up. because I'm gotta... watching Cobra Kai. I did not want to watch Cobra Kai. It is so good. It's so good. It does such a good job of, like, making you live back in the 80s, doesn't it? It's fun. It's really so, fun. So funny. Johnny is the best character ever. He is. The fact that he knows nothing about anything. He's like, what's a Facebook? 
Yeah. You know, and he makes fun of kids. He calls a kid Lip, and Lip turns to Hawk. Yeah. And he makes fun of the 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 kid with the man boobs, and it is just so funny. Now the whole weirdness of his son training with Daniel San and Daniel San's daughter dating his pupil. It, it, that's confusing to me. Yeah, that's a little tricky. But the show itself is amazing. I, I promised that I would watch one episode and then I would just shut it off because I would hate it. And I watched the one episode and I was so pumped. And the cool thing is that they show the old stuff. You know, yeah, like the old movie. Yeah. Dutch is in, yeah. Did oh. you get to the part where the old guys go back to a bar and get into a bar fight? Uh-uh. Okay, that's a great episode. Uh-uh. So, so does the old mean sensei show up eventually? Do you want me to tell you? I just need to know if he shows up. Oh, yeah. John oh, Kreese. Oh, my back. God. Yeah, it's awesome. Oh, my God. That's, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. So I can't wait. I'm on season one, episode nine. You know who else shows up is Daniel's mother. Yeah, she showed up just in episode eight. Yeah, she's she looks awesome. great. But it's like, that's Mrs. LaRussa. It's so funny. It's like the only person they couldn't get to show up was Elizabeth Shue because she was in The Boys, which you haven't watched. Man, Elizabeth Shue in Karate Kid 1. Now, that's a, that's a boy's dream right there. Yeah, except for the scene when he wins with the stupid crow kick, which is so stupid because Johnny comes in like this, right? You mean the crane? Yeah, the crane, not the crow. Sorry. The crane, crane technique, no can defense, Mike. Well, yeah, if you come in like this. I know, why would he come in like that? Right, with his face first. Yeah, you know? yeah. I should take this off. Ugh. Let me switch up. The so how about this for trivia, Mike? How about this for trivia? Daniel, uh, or what, what is his name? Ralph Macchio in real life. Yeah. The same age as Pat Morita was in Karate Kid 1. That's amazing. Isn't he, that amazing? He's the fountain of youth. Him and Rob Lowe and people like that. I don't know yeah, how they do it, it but. Cause, Cause Johnny looks, looks a little rough, you know, he looks yeah, he fine, looks but he, look, yeah. he looks, he looks his age. Right. And, uh, Ralph Macchio looks like a, like a little kid. And uh, yeah. yeah, I'm excited about that. Elizabeth Shue at the end, when he, when he, when he does crane him in the face and she comes running up on stage, she looks a little plump and chunky. And well, she's wearing that sweater with that little mini skirt thing. Yeah. So that, that kind of sticks in your head cause that's a famous scene, but uh now, what what was it? Leaving Las Vegas, where Nicolas Cage was the raging alcoholic. Yes, that I liked her in that. Yeah. And I could I could see that life happening to me eventually too. So, anyways, that's what I'm watching. What are you watching? You know, it's been light recently. There hasn't been a much lot on. We've watched Bachelorette, which remains very good, and Claire has now fallen in love with Dale, and that part of the show is over. And there's a new bachelorette coming in for the rest of the guys. So that's bad. Um, man, it's been like, I've been watching a lot of West Wing. Mm, you watch Superstore? No, I don't. Uh, no, uh, This Is Us. This Is Us is oh, back. Yeah, that's what, I don't watch that yet. Um, Superstore's back on. Mom's back on, but without Christy, who is everything, Anna Ferris to the show, so... Yeah, I've lost, I've lost track of mom. I just kind of watch reruns of that. I watch reruns of that every night. I'm like a, like really like a simpleton. Like it's on the country music channel at eight o'clock almost every night. And <laughs> every night I just, I don't even put on anything new. I just sit there and stare. And I know the episodes by heart. Like the other, within the first two seconds, I'm like, oh, this is the episode where uh, Jill loses the baby, you yeah. know? And like, I know it all. So I'm yeah. just the biggest loser. And then some people text me and they say, what are you watching? I'm like, mom. And they get very upset. But You watch Teen Mom too? No. Do you Great. watch 16 and Pregnant? No, I can't get into that. But Teen Mom 2, we've watched for about eight, nine years, 10 years now. So the kids are like grownups now. So it's actually kind of fun. You've to grown up with them. Follow their journey. Almost as like your kids. Yeah, exactly. How old is your daughter? She's three and a half. Oh, okay. And you're thinking about having another kid? Yes. You got to do more than think about it, just to let you know. But you're going to space them out that way, four? Well, that's the goal, but, you know. And that's it, right, two? Two. That's, yes. Yeah, because David Attenborough says you should only have one. You should have none. Because you're none. just on the okay. planet. But two is pushing it. 
Are you still watching that? Uh, that it was stuff? just a one. It was a one deal. I I'm, I watched my octopus teacher last night. Uh, it's a documentary about a guy who establishes like a really close um, relationship with an octopus. Oh, I have a show for you. What? It might be a little too high brow for you because it's about chess. Mm -hmm. But it's called The Queen's Gambit. And it's on Netflix. And we watched one episode and it's very, very good. And we're going to stick with it, I think. There's one I'm going to watch that's about... The man on the high throne castle, castle? High about castle. if 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 Germany and Japan won World yeah. War Two, that yeah. looks interesting to me too. So that is good, but it's a little less like political and more like like spy. You know what's very good? Did you watch the Americans? Have you seen the Americans? No, I heard if you liked Homeland, I heard you liked the Americans. Awesome, awesome. The Americans. I watch that, yeah. but I'm on Cobra Kai right now. It's absolutely amazing. The music. It's, great it's so unbelievably great how about johnny's car i mean that's His car's awesome and and everything about that show is just amazingly awesome i don't know it stays know. good too it stays good yeah so um i guess we could wrap it up because i have to pee really bad okay um uh, i could do that on the pod but i don't think that'll get us higher rating so please follow adam gorney on twitter at adam gorney um he gives an opinion once every week, I think, about stuff. Yeah, about um, Saturday, 9.30 p.m. If you get <laughs> Schedule your notifications for Adam Gorey to drop his one nugget of uh, opinion on Saturday at 9.30 Eastern time. Yeah. Follow me at Rivals Mike. Follow my Instagram, which is growing exponentially at Rivals Godfather. I mean, it, it couldn't be better. Um, okay. Next week, I'll show you another one of the guys back here. Um Perfect. I showed you Ernie Sims last week and you couldn't guess him right. So, um, but yeah, kudos, shout out, Oregon football, gorgeous helmets, just two great helmets. Unbelievable. Last week I showed you Indiana, gorgeous helmets too. Yeah. Um, next week, we'll see. Surprise you. So let's wrap it up. <laughs>